Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, Modernizing Your Human Resource Management Course with Talia Bauer and David Coughlin. My name is Sarah Pinella and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for the Business and Management List here at Sage Publishing. Let me begin by introducing you to our speakers. Talia Bauer is the Cameron Professor of Management at Portland State University and former president for the Society of Industry and Organizational Society. Yeah psychology, uh, also known as PSYOP. She is one of the most influential human resource source researchers in the world and a fellow at PSYOP, APA, and APS. She is the past editor of the Journal of Management and has won major teaching awards from AOM and PSYOP. She is also the first ever management scholar at Google. David Coughlin is the prof Cameron Professor HR Analytics and Instructor of Management at Portland State University, where he teaches each introduction to HRM, HRIS, and People Analytics, as well as OB. He was also awarded the Teaching Innovation Award at Portland State University. Talia and David are both part of the author team of the new textbook from Sage Publishing, Fundamentals of Human Resource Management, People, Data, and Analytics, as well as, well as last year's publication, Human Resource Management, people, data, and analytics. This one hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing, and we will be sending out a link to view it and access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. If you have any problem with the audio or viewing mode during this webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen, and one of our team members will help get you, um, get you help as soon as possible. At the end of the webinar, we will have some time for Q&A from our attendees, so please also use the Q&A box to ask any questions to speakers throughout the webinar. Note that web, the webinar hashtag at Sage Talks, and feel free to use this as well to ask questions or leave comments. Let's take a moment and get to know our audience by asking a few polling questions. First stop. What contemporary topics are you wanting to add to your HRM course? Please use the polling at the side to answer the questions. Great, I see lots of HR analytics, emerging technologies are the forerunners, forerunners here followed by HR decision making. Okay, we have one other poll that we're gonna ask. Are you incorporating data analytics into your HRM course now? Looks like a good, a, Bunch of you are doing it, but most of you want to and not sure how to get there yet. So that's great. We'll be addressing these topics as we get into the webinar today too. Okay, thank you everybody for participating and telling a little bit more about yourselves. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Talia to get us started. Talia? Thanks, Sarah. Hmm. I'm not, okay, it's any question. Hi everyone, sorry about the technical difficulties. So as Sarah mentioned, David and I have been doing this for a long time. Um, I calculated, we have a collective 40 years of experience teaching HR. Um, and so while a lot has changed in that time, what we realized when we sat down and thought about what we were teaching is that a lot hadn't changed. Um, and so we really wanted to think about how to modernize it and help students kind of see those changes and be prepared for them. So the outline for this presentation is pretty simple. We're gonna talk about the macro changes that affect HRM. These will not be surprises to you, but seeing them in one place uh, is a kind of a nice starter. And preparing students for today's workforce, what those issues seem to be. And then really focusing in on some examples around HR decision-making, some examples of how we've approached legal issues and ethical issues, 
And then David will take a deeper dive into emerging technologies and data analytics. So this is the order that will go through the outline. And first we're gonna start with macro changes affecting HRM. So there are a lot that we could have chosen. We decided to focus in on these six. Um, David and I had an opportunity to really get into thinking about this as we were developing, um, writing a textbook on HR that really we thought would meet the needs of what we were seeing students needed. And we looked at a survey of what was out there and what the issues were. We really focused in on changing demographics, the emerging gig economy and the changing work contract and the way that things get done, the increasing globalization that we've been seeing for years, and then especially new, the technology and availability of data and the ethical and CSR challenges associated with all of these things, as well as HR in general. So when I talk about those changes that we saw, um, and I've been doing this for a long time, the first time I taught this class, I think was in 1991. Uh, and I remember you know, the concepts and the book and what we really thought students needed to know to meet what employers were telling us was around how do you get things done, the transactional nature. So how do we decide what to pay people? How do we decide what benefits and how do we involve them in that process? So the percentage of time that we spent educating students was associated with the things they were asked to do once they got jobs. And really we've all uh, lamented forever how when it comes to HR, we don't spend a lot of time on transformational work. We don't often have a seat on the at the table uh, in major decision-making within organizations. And so the transformational um, work was at a much smaller percentage and you had to be higher up in the organization before you were asked to do those things. But all of that has really changed increasingly with automation. So when you know students still absolutely have to know how to decide about compensation and, and what benefits and all of the transactional issues behind the scenes, but the paperwork of getting it done has become very automated. It has been made very much self-service uh, added to the HR functions. And what that's done is freed up HR individuals to really engage in more of those transformational activities. And in fact, that's really expected by employers these days. And so what we saw over and over again was that this required new HR skills and knowledge of our students. And we just weren't sure that what we had to offer them um, was gonna be getting the job done. So to prepare students for today's workforce and really thinking about it, we wanted to come up with different ways to help bring HR to life. So we've been teaching the traditional and contemporary topics uh, forever in terms of uh, job analysis and design, workforce planning, recruitment, um, thinking about diversity and legal issues, turnover and retentions. Those things clearly haven't gone away. Um, so we didn't want to not address those topics, but we also wanted to infuse our course and the education that those majors were getting, uh, as well as people who take it as electives, um, to understand contemporary topics. So what are the ethical issues? Ethical issues have always been around, um, but we see really a heightened speed at which we need to think about these things and how often we're asked to make these ethical decisions as things are changing. And the law hasn't really caught up with us in some ways. Also, privacy issues. Again, they've always been there, but with the access to data and how much is stored and how much we can know about people, that's really been a change as well. And so we really wanted students to spend time thinking about ethical and privacy issues in a new way and a deeper way. Again, modern global and international issues always have been uh, there for a long time, for the last decades. Uh, we've been talking about that, but the scale and the scope is increasing. The need for small and medium businesses to think about these issues as well and how they can leverage um, all of them uh, as they're emerging uh, is important. One of the big things we spent a lot of time thinking about was kind of the paradox that for HR majors, often there's HR information systems class offered. It's not always required, but there wasn't a book that covered HR information systems as an entire chapter. And yet we know for kind of this coming modernization that with data and how it's stored and how different platforms speak to one another, 
is critical in terms of what we're able to do on that transformational side with basic information and HR analytics. Uh, and so one of the things we really wanted to do was make sure that students were more deeply viewed, uh, kind of immersed in that and that that was infused in their education. And then there's also technologies that are new like blockchain that we just didn't see available in other uh, platforms. Implications of things like wearables and monitors, uh, monitoring, you kind of see every time you pick up an article uh, in the news or um, look at a link of something that's happened with, again, those privacy and ethical and legal issues. And then the big one um, was HR analytics. And we were finding our students were sometimes um, unaware of what was possible. And when they got a taste of it, they were very excited. And rather than being intimidated, I uh, felt really empowered. And the great thing is that obviously employers were excited about that too. So in our ability to really help modernize students' skills and outlooks, it's been um, really leveraging all of these things around what's possible with analytics as well in a way that is non-threatening and that they're ready for. So the key contemporary topics that we're gonna cover in this webinar our HR decision-making, legal and ethical issues, and I'll cover those. And then I'll hand it off to David for more time on emerging technologies and data analytics. So for HR decision-making, I'm glad that came up in the poll as one of the important factors. Um, it's a thing over and over again, we hear about uh, employers wanting to see more of and students in general, and for HR students in particular. And so we try to think about what are some of the barriers that get in the way, um, because this is something we've talked about for a long time in education. And so we wanted to give them tools. That was really important to us in terms of how we were educating students. And so we came up with the idea of um, offering them managers toolboxes. And the first one that we wanted them to really focus in on was how to make effective decisions. And I don't know where you all are in terms of your student population, but we have some students who've never worked on one side of the spectrum and others that have a great deal of work experience, but they only have their own experience. And so either way, we thought there was an opportunity to help expose them um, to more around decision making than they might have seen at their current level with their current experience. And so we developed a rubric um, or framework to help students think through uh, whether or not the decisions they were making were effective. So characteristics of effective HRM decisions. And we wanted them to ask themselves for each important decision, basic questions like, is it legal, ethical, and fair? Is it evidence-based and evidence-informed? Why are they moving in the direction they are? What do they know from other people's experience and from research? Were these decisions going to foster healthy employee-employer relationships? And what's the context around that? Were they time and cost effective? And had they taken a systematic stakeholder perspective? And when they'd done all of those things, which was a little bit hard or clunky at first for them to work through the rubric and really think about it um, in terms of a, almost a worksheet format, that was something that became much more comfortable to them and much more routine as they saw this week after week. And so it was something we integrated throughout with different exercises, such as um, an HR reasoning and decision-making exercise we created where they were looking at an employee turnover rate and we give them a very small scenario and ask them to think about that. And then layered on that, ask them to do that decision-making analysis. And so that's something that just kind of helped make them feel more comfortable, more confident, um, and they said at the, by the end of the term that they also felt like they were making better decisions. In terms of legal issues, again, as I said, um, those haven't changed. I think what we wanted to change were the examples and having them feel modern and current for our students. And so one that's really resonated well with students and faculty have also told me that they enjoy using this one, um, is thinking about tattoos in the workplace and what is legal and what's not legal and what are some uh, pieces of advice that we can give to people. And this is something that is coming up you know, more and more and yet we don't necessarily always think about it. We might have implicit reactions positively or negatively, um, but what do we really know if we focus in on that for a few minutes in the class? And so these are the kinds of things that students really get engaged in. 
people issues is another one where we really wanted to focus in. So again, they've always been covered, or not always, but often been covered in HRM courses. Um, and there's a lot of issues, but what we really specifically wanted to do was help students get more modern skills around this to deal with the legally ambiguous and gray areas, because the law hasn't really caught up with us on a lot of issues around data and analytics and what's possible versus what we should be doing. Um, this is something they need to spend time early on in their careers thinking about, just because they can do something should they be doing. And we also wanted them to consider the broader impact of their decisions. Again, with that HR um, decision-making rubric, we're kind of forcing them to think through what is going on and all the could we, but should we questions. And we do that by focusing in on ethical matters exercises. There are other ways to do this, of course, um, but we found that by doing cases and then having a robust Q&A and and letting them talk in small groups and then at the larger classroom. Um, this is a way to just kind of make it matter of fact that we're going to talk about this every class meeting. Um, and it's something that becomes um, part of the conversation instead of an afterthought. And we also, I've talked about how much we wanted to help students understand HRM and the context of HRM. And so a lot of ways that we wanted to do that. I think the more that I can do this, the more effective I am in the classroom, um, the more it brings it to life for students. And again, even when they have a lot of experience, it's having experience outside of their own realm. So this is one where if you don't have any work experience, um, understanding feedback delivery best practices, um, that information was probably in the chapter anyway putting it in one kind of focused area where they're kind of thinking best practices to recognize contributions, conduct regular one-on-one -on -one meetings, which we know is one of the critical factors in being effective, be a role model for feedback, focusing on actual behaviors or results rather than personality, and using the stop, start, stop, continue model. And so for someone without work experience, this can be something that helps them kind of go through one of those difficult conversations or even a positive experience. Um, but people who have a lot of experience, it can help. Maybe they were doing three out of the five or four out of the five, but it gives them another tool and another tip to address that a little more thoroughly. We also found that some kind of short HR and action features helped students. We, we, uh, I tend to kick off every class meeting with one of these. They're short, uh, bite-sized. They allow them to just kind of get in there and talk about HR. And rather than um, kind of starting from the procedures or the theory or the issues, um, we can just talk about something specific and kind of get people talking. Cases are also critical. I don't engage in these every course, uh, every course session. And sometimes these are in written form, but also it's another way to take a deeper dive and students respond well to kind of seeing a lot of information about the cases. Um, we have this in the appendix in the book um, because of the sometimes we have time and sometimes we don't in a given class session. And then finally, industry interviews, having videos with people. We have a couple organizations that we focused in on and having them talk about their challenges, how they dealt with data and analytics, how technology has transformed things is another way to bring it in uh, to the classroom virtually. And just having those available has been something that students have responded to um, really robustly as well. So that wraps it up for the first two. I'm going to go ahead and change the presenter over to David and let him take it from here. Thank you. And Talia, this is Lauren. Um, just while we're switching over, we did have one question asking if you recommend covering the ethics competency from SHRM as part of the ethics coverage in your course. Yeah, I definitely uh, think one of the things that we have done here is we work very closely with um, the SHRM materials. Um, and, and so we do see that as the framework that we use as well. Um, so we introduce students to that. Now, some students are HR majors, and so that's um, something that they need to be much more steeped in, and others are you know, future managers, and so, um, so that's something they need to be aware of, but maybe they take a little bit of a deeper, less of a deep dive on that. Thank you. Yeah.
Excellent, thank you. So transitioning over here, uh, let me pop up the slides from my perspective. All right, well, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. So I'm David Coughlin, and I know some of you are logging on from the West Coast here, some from the East Coast and some people in between. So I hope your days are going well. So thank you, Talia, for walking us through legal issues, ethical issues, as well as how to prepare our students. I'm gonna talk about a couple other key contemporary issues that we found have been really effective and important to talk to our undergraduate students in particular, as Talia mentioned, whether they're HRM majors or if they're just students who are taking the HR class as an elective. Sometimes, I, particularly for the latter group, students who are taking HR as an elective and they're concentrating in a different area, such as finance or supply chain, it's actually a really cool way to build um, perceived, I don't want to use the word legitimacy necessarily, but to, for them to understand that HR uses a lot of technologies and uses a lot of data analytic techniques or could use these technologies and data analytic techniques that these other areas already use or are starting to use as well. And so hopefully that helps the students start understanding that a lot of these are tools that can be transferable across different areas and hopefully gets um, non-majors and majors excited about coming into HR, especially with the changing landscape. So let's start with emerging technologies. So what we've been seeing is, this is a, a time old tale here, the acceleration of technology and how our technological and data capabilities change. Um, typically, we see what we consider to be an acceleration or exponential growth over time, which you can see here represented by this blue curve um, with X, or time on the x-axis and technological capabilities on the y-axis. And so as we've seen this acceleration of technology, we've also seen this proliferation of different tools and platforms that we can use uh, to help us manage data, to help us better manage our workforce and the people within the company as well. And a lot of these tools are transferable um, and can be used across the business and not just within HR. So we do have the classic players like Oracle and IBM. And um, a lot of these companies have been evolving quite rapidly and incorporating more data ana analytics tools and platforms within their enterprise resource planning platforms themselves, within their HR information system specific tools and platforms they have and so forth. But we've also seen um, technologies, as Talia mentioned, like wearable technology and monitoring technologies that have been made possible by companies like Fitbit, where they can track data, whether it's heart rate, geographic location, and placement of workers within the organization. And even with the advent of sociometric badges, we're seeing some companies starting to track um, actual interactions between employees, not necessarily recording conversations, but being able to um, record and track the tone of the interactions and using sophisticated algorithms to determine whether that was a positive, ne uh, positive, negative, or neutral interaction between employees and understand how these formal and informal networks evolve. Uh, we also have really great tools available for us today like Tableau and Power BI, which are great for visualizing data and creating interactive, dynamic reporting tools and dashboards that are commonly used in organizations today. And we also have, we live in a really amazing time where we have really powerful programming languages like R and Python available to us, um, which have really revolutionized how we acquire, or rather how we manage, we store, and how we interact with data in terms of analyzing and reporting and visualizing the data that we have. And finally, we also have platforms like Hadoop, which can be really powerful when we have larger vast amounts of data coming in very quickly, or in other words, big data that we're trying to ask access and we need distributed power and so forth to do that effectively. But with all that said, um, even classic tools like through Microsoft, like Excel can be a really good gateway and many organizations still use Excel extensively. And Excel can be a great tool for demonstrating how to work with data. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on and show some examples. So in terms of emerging technologies, in addition to those specific tools and platforms that have been proliferating, we also see a changing landscape in terms of how traditional HR practices have been influenced by available technologies. So one of the ones that I hear quite commonly from my students based on some of their own firsthand experience is both proctored or unproctored structured interviews that are video recorded. Uh, some of them have experienced this firsthand as applicants. And so these automated video structured interviews represent a new way in which we can maybe more efficiently capture interview data and so forth. 
and also do it in a very structured way. Of course, this has questions or it leads to questions regarding what do we do with these recordings afterwards, after we're done with them, how do we score them, and um, other types of data privacy, security, and ethical dilemmas that we might face. Um, of course, when we're using wearable technologies, giving Fitbits to our employees or other types of activity trackers, the question then becomes, well, what are we gonna do with those data? And are we going to ensure that those data are only used for pre-specified purposes? And um, for example, not using them to predict performance if we haven't gotten employees' consent to do so. We also have this shifting landscape in terms of technology and information systems where now a lot of the software programs we interact with are software as a service meaning we can log on usually through a web portal or a browser, browser, and we can do a lot of our work when it comes to HR, um, using data stored in the cloud, so to speak, and not having to manage our own service, servers locally. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, we have an increasing ability to be able to deliver information in a dynamic, interactive way for managers and other key decision makers via these decision support tools like dashboards, which are commonly made possible today in Tableau and Power BI Microsoft. And we also have new ways to ensure data integrity and security via emerging technologies around blockchain, for instance. And I just saw, I think it was a few months ago, Workday announced that they were using blockchain technology to do credentialing with um, employer applicant information. So if someone says that they have a credential in a certain area or degree, to being able to verify that and ensure that that's accurate. And blockchain technology represents one opportunity for that. And then generally there's this trend towards digital transformation, not just of HR, but all aspects of work. And so that means increased use of data and these emerging technologies can be great tools for helping to manage that. Now we don't expect students to walk away from an intro HR class or even a more advanced undergrad HR class understanding all the technologies available, but I think it is useful exposing them to at least what we found useful in our classes to cases and so forth and hands-on activities that show them what's available and the logic behind these and how these technologies can bring HR processes to life, make them more efficient and potentially more effective as well. So as Talia mentioned earlier, we um, saw this gap in a lot of the textbooks that we had been looking at previously for the courses we taught in that HR information systems were maybe mentioned, but there wasn't that much attention placed on them. But given the reality of where many of the HR students end up today, a lot of them are gonna be interacting directly or indirectly with their company's HR information systems or enterprise resource planning platforms um, as soon as they start their job. So we thought it was important to have an entire chapter. And in our courses, we'll have an entire week or parts of week in which we'll focus on data management and human resource information systems or HRS so that students can really get on top of this and understand what the purpose is um, when it comes to acquiring, storing, managing, analyzing, reporting, and uh, making decisions and telling stories with the data and information that we have access to. And part of working with data, some of that data might reside already in the HR information system or more broadly in an enterprise resource planning platform or an ERP. Um, we have to wonder, what do we do with the data? And so Talia and I have a colleague who works for SAP Success Factories, and he's based locally in the Portland, Oregon area. And our colleague, Steve Hunt, likes to say, and he actually wrote a white paper for uh, Society for Human Resource Management, I believe last year or the year before, um, with a title to the effect of something like, HR data are only good if you use them. And so that's one thing we wanna to emphasize to students too, is that it's great to collect and store data, but there's different legal and ethical concerns we might have around that. But it's also a big question of what do we do with the data once we have it? And how can we pose good questions to the data um, that we can answer using those available data? And so one thing that we like to incorporate into our classes are different spotlights on new emerging types of technologies such as gamification of personnel selection procedures and how we can apply those to really what is a traditional area of HR selection, employee selection, and how can we use a tool like this to gain information on our applicants that can be ultimately predictive of the criterion of job performance. And so by highlighting these different things, it kind of keeps things exciting for the students. Gamification in particular seems to resonate with a lot of students, um, especially students who maybe um, are, in, are engaged in video gaming themselves. 
this is kind of a fun way to think about, well, that we don't have to necessarily stick to the classic structures of um, having a structured interview, having these other selection tools that were usually ubiquitous in the selection context. We can also add on to those other types of selection tools and procedures that are more modern and maybe keep the applicants more engaged and perhaps even um, result in more positive applicant reactions um, after and during the selection process. So as I mentioned earlier, another thing that's been really grabbing hold of um, HR and essentially all aspects of business and beyond is blockchain technology right now. I mentioned that example with Workdate um, and being able to apply credentialing uh, use, using blockchain technology. And so just briefly, when we're talking about blockchain, we're talking about a distributed incor incorruptible digital technology infrastructure that maintains a fully encoded database that serves as a ledger where all transactions are recorded and stores stored. And so initially, a lot of examples in business were focused around the supply chain, but there's absolutely different HR applications. And this is a fun area for students to brainstorm in, thinking of what are all the possibilities that blockchain for technology, for example, um, could potentially apply to. And we're really just at the beginning of this thought process in HR and more broadly. And so I think that makes it fun for the students as well to really feel like they're on the cutting edge or the cusp of something that could be very transform uh, transformative to HR. Another thing that we like to focus on too with technology is, uh, let's say we do wanna, as we're focusing on our HR information systems and the data that we have in them, well, not only should we think about how and why we're collecting data, but also what is the quality or the integrity of the data we have access to and that we're already currently storing. And so often I find this is best illustrated by giving students access to just an Excel sample data file with some different fields or variables that um, would commonly be uh, pictured or uh, provided in an HR information system, such as employee ID, employee name, job level, location, and department, as you can see in this example here. And then actually working through and identifying, well, where do we see um, issues in terms of the data integrity? Do we see missing values that need to be populated? Where would we go about finding that information? Who is the owner or the steward of that particular field? So who would we go to, for example, if you notice in the sample table on the left there, there's two missing department variables for two employees there. Who would we go to that would be the steward of that data that could help us make sure that we get accurate and timely information um, and replacement values for those two missing values there? And also talking to students using things like pivot tables in Excel and showing them how you can identify issues related to um, uh, data validation errors and so forth. So one example I like giving is if you allow people to enter text, for example, um, by themselves and you don't have any validation rules in place, they might misspell things. If your system that you're using has case sensitivity, meaning it's sensitive to whether something is lowercase or uppercase, that can actually have implications for whether it treats a value as the same or as different from another value that looks similar. And so here you can see that for the location variable, if we show them how to run through a pivot table and that there's two different labels for Beaverton. And it looks like someone who entered the data misspelled Beaverton in um, one of the cases. And so it actually shows up as a distinct category um, aside from the Beaverton that is the correct spelling. And so this can hopefully be illustrative for students to understand, well, we need to make sure that we take time to clean our data and effectively manage the data. And I always like to share with the students the 80-20 rule, which is, Typically, when it comes to doing any kind of work with data, you're gonna spend about 80% of your time managing your data and only about 20% of the data, uh, or 20% of the time analyzing the data and reporting it out and interpreting it. And my experience tends to be more like a 90-10 or a 95-5 type um, breakdown in, based on the fact that often I find that I underestimate greatly how long it's going to take to make sure the data are clean and that we've managed them effectively before we can even use the data to try to make better decisions. So here's an example of um, that Excel uh, data cleaning tool that we just showed you. Here's the example of where a student could work through this and we give them background information about the variables or fields they have access to in an Excel file that they can download from the textbook website. Um, they walk through, we show them via different steps how they can use just very common Excel tools like filtering and so forth 
as data cleaning tools and many platforms that they might use have similar types of features that you can use as well. So we find that these skills can be pretty transferable and get them ready to eventually step into um, a proprietary HR information system or enterprise resource planning platform. I, we also show them how to do data validation and things like that to ensure that you get good data being entered into the system as well. Okay, so now shifting gears once more, um, let's talk about more specifically data analytics and how that can be introduced into a course. And this is, of course, a huge key contemporary area. HR analytics is has been gaining a lot of traction. It's been become uh, Society of Human Resource Management has been espousing the value of data analytics and HR analytics and people analytics for quite some time now. And it's really cool to hear, see now that we have a lot of students coming to us that come to take HR because they've heard of HR analytics and they want to learn more about it. Whereas when we started teaching, uh, we also, in addition to our introductory HRM course, uh, Talia and I created an HR information system and people analytics course in 2016. And when we started that course, we had to really convince students that data was important and that this is a skill set that will, is valuable and we become more valuable in HR. And now it's really neat to see that students already know this coming in and they're very excited to even in their introductory HR courses, learn how to work with data. So when it comes to data analytics, uh, we are seeing, as I'll talk about a little bit more and give a little bit more information about this in just a moment, we are seeing that uh, data analytics knowledge and skills are increasingly important for HR professionals. And a lot of these don't have to be necessarily sophisticated data modeling and what we classically think as more advanced data science knowledge and skills. A lot of these can be based around, well, what data do we have and what questions can we pose and formulate that can help us, that we can answer using the available data. And sometimes that can be using basic arithmetic, so adding, subtracting, dividing things, as well as using uh, simple inferential statistics um, and applications like t-tests and regression, simple linear regression models and so forth. And so those are things that we introduce the students to as well. And SHRM, as I mentioned, has really been uh, supporting this initiative of trying to upskill HR in the area of data analytics. And we see this in particular with their competency model and their critical evaluation um, competence, competency within that model, which is really geared towards not only working with data and technology to make better decisions, but also applying critical thinking and logic, which is really excellent that they're taking that approach because really what we're trying to do here is build students levels of data literacy. And often we think of data literacy, there's three key components to that, which are of course the math and statistics components, so knowledge and skills related to math and statistics, as well as data visualization and actually presenting data. And then finally, the third competence or aspect of data literacy that we uh, need to focus on is critical thinking and logic. So how do we ask good questions? How do we work with the data and make informed decisions and not just run analysis for uh, run analyses for the sake of running analyses? So getting people to back up and take a more strategic, thoughtful, intentional mindset to data analytics is really important. And that's one thing that we try to illustrate through case examples and so forth and apply data exercises within the course. Um, and we are fully aware that HR analytics is not traditionally taught in HRM courses. And we saw that, I saw that initially with people's responses to the initial polling question we gave you regarding whether you're currently doing this. Um, this is, and this is when it comes to introductory HRM courses, it's been in the past three or four years that we've started just introducing this. And, um, and before that, we were aware that it just wasn't a common thing that if you're taking an introductory HR course, that you'd be exposed in any uh, substantive sense to working with data and the importance of data. So in terms of how to actually integrate data analytics into our HRM courses, uh, we found that the, one of the best things is using data analytics exercises. We use Excel, but you can use other platforms and tools as well to do this. Um, I'm sure Tableau would be a great tool to use um, with teaching students in my more advanced class. I teach them how to um, apply R, which is a statistical programming language to run their analyses and so forth. But Excel is a great tool. Often by the time they reach us in the introductory HR course, they have some, if not quite a bit of experience working Excel in Excel. So the tool is familiar, but the way in which they're going to apply the tool and the context will be new for them. And it's a cool way for them to take their context and domain knowledge and HR they're learning 
and then uh, incorporate data analytics into that knowledge and really see that these can be very thoughtfully in intertwined. And the way that we help integrate data analytics into our courses, as I mentioned before, is through examples such as cases. Um, in the textbook chapters, we include a lot of examples even within the text itself. And we also um, bring in these those uh, Excel exercises I mentioned before to really bring things to life. So a really basic example is thinking and teaching how to actually calculate something that's relatively simple, but sometimes we take for granted like a turnover rate. And so calculating simple metrics like this, I, we found can be really help elucidate what does this metric actually mean and why is it important to have accurate and timely data when you're calculating these metrics? And so just showing them that applying simple division can help us get helps us get to this turnover rate can be a really neat way to kind of lift the veil in terms of understanding that a lot of what we're doing isn't really hard math, um, but we need to be thoughtful about what data we're applying to it and what the context is and how we're going to use this for decision making. So in this way, we're really trying to think and help students reframe HR as a science that HR is really about this confluence of human resources, content knowledge of those traditional areas that we highlighted initially in this presentation and integrating that with data informed decision making. We bring those together and we've really got HR analytics or data analytics applied to HR. And so we're talking about HR analytics here. We're taking a very broad definition. We're talking about HR analytics as the process of collecting, analyzing, reporting people-related data for the purpose of improving decision-making, informing and supporting strategy, and sustaining a competitive advantage. So what we're really trying to get them to think about, again, is not just, yes, maybe you learned how to run certain types of statistical analyses and so forth in other courses that you took, but we're trying to get them to think from a strategic standpoint, from a business standpoint, what is the question you're trying to answer? What is the problem you're trying to solve? And how can you go about doing that better if you have ac uh, access to accurate and timely data? And so when I say HR analytics, I really am using this as a synonym for other terms such as people analytics, human capital analytics, talent analytics, and workforce analytics. So as I alluded to before, HR is really at this important inflection point right now in terms of the acceleration of HR analytics. And this I think is best illustrated by a 2018 Deloitte Global Human Capital Trends Report where they surveyed a bunch of companies and they found that uh, of these companies, 85% rated HR analytics as important or very important. And 70% indicated they were actively working towards integrating HR analytics into key and strategic decision-making. So the perceived need was there, the momentum is there. However, um, only 42% of those companies rated themselves as ready or very ready for this HR analytics trend. And one of the explanations for this is that the workforce isn't quite ready for it yet. Um, this is not something that has been traditionally taught in HR courses and that HR professionals were expected to have um, these levels of data literacy. And so this really opens up a cool opportunity for students who are about to enter the job market in terms of trying to upskill in this area as they're going through the degree and they're finishing up their bachelor's degree. So they come onto the workforce and hopefully are ready to um, start thinking about how to use data effectively in the HR context. And this is also more broadly echoed too, um, not just within HR, but definitely within HR. We see this in the popular media too, over the past five to 10 years, you've seen um, titles in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times and other news outlets that are fairly prominent like data science, the numbers of our lives, big data trying to build better workers, um, data crunching is coming to help your boss manage your time and so forth, and the algorithm tells the boss who might quit. And so this students we realize are reading these, um, or at least are aware of these headlines, they know that this is happening, and this has actually been a really good thing um, in terms of their awareness as they come into an HR course, they're usually primed to think about, okay, I've heard a bit about analytics, and I wanna understand more how we can understand our people better and plan and manage our people better if we use data and um, how do we get that data? How do we manage that data? How do we analyze it and tell a story about it? So as I mentioned, we use cases often to first kind of contextualize why data analytics and HR analytics is specifically is valuable for an organization. And so here's one that we use in the textbook and I really like this case sharing it with students is the case of Chevron. They've done um, a really good job of incorporating HR analytics 
into not only HR, but also important decision-making within the organization. And they've created some really, at least what they've reported outwardly, some uh, predictive models in terms of predicting who, uh, what is the future attrition that they can expect and so they can engage in better workforce planning in terms of identifying what are the drivers of those atten uh, uh, the, that attrition and figuring out how they can influence those different drivers to reduce that attrition in the future. Uh, we also see uh, the HR analytics applied to uh, diversity and legal issues as well. And so highlighting things like the diversity initiative at Kimberly Clark is another example that we like to use and generally getting people to think about and the students thinking about well, what are all the different ways potentially we could apply and use data in HR across all the traditional areas of HR? And it's really exciting to see them uh, be able to recognize, oh, wow, we can use a lot of the same types of tools, but across different functional areas of HR and even across different functional areas of the business more broadly. Um, and as I mentioned before, just showing them how to calculate a basic turnover rate and annualized turnover rate in Excel can be usually very informative for students and help demystify HR or analytics and data analytics. Even simple descriptive analytics like this can be quite powerful um, and just helping them get a grasp on it. And I found and we found that this can be a really good gateway for students that have what, what I like to call sometimes quantitative trauma or numeric phobia, where at some point in their educational career, or their life, they were turned away or they got disillusioned or kind of scared of working with data, working with numbers via math or statistics. And by contextualizing working with data in an environment hopefully they care about and a context they care about, which is HR, often they start to see, oh, okay, math and statistics can be pretty powerful and pretty cool tools. And suddenly they start remembering things different types of techniques that maybe they'd been exposed to multiple times before, but now they're able to actually place this into their memory in a context that makes sense to them. And they can start to see how these tools are useful for decision-making purposes. And so this is just uh, some screenshots of how we actually walk through, uh, through some supplemental exercises that we have available on the website. If you choose to include, for example, these Excel data exercises, students can work through and actually practice calculating things like turnover rates. And we also have some other exercises too where they can practice estimating a simple linear regression model, practice interpreting correlations and things like that that can be quite powerful for them. Okay, so this really wraps up where we went today in terms of how do we modernize our HRM courses. Um, there's about, as Talia talked about, there's a lot of macro changes that have affected HR and what can we do to actually prepare our students for today's workforce. And one of the things that she highlighted was HR decision making. And that's really where everything else that we've talked about today gets couched into is how are we going to make a better decision that, as Talia broke down, that is fair, legal, ethical, that is taking different stakeholders into account and so forth and so on. And so we finish up by talking about some specific examples or key contemporary issues that have really um, started to change how we think about HR and change the way we do um, HR in an organization. Okay, so now what we'd like to do is shift over this time to Q&A. Yeah. And so this is an opportunity for you all to ask questions and we can answer it here. And uh, so just type those into the chat feature and we can start uh, working through those. Thank you very much, David and Talia, for the presentation. And yeah, you beat me to it. So let's, uh, if you guys have any questions, let's use the question box on the side. Um, David, I do have one question. Can you talk, you know, a lot of people seem to be interested in the HR analytics piece, and you talked about that a little bit, but can you talk about the benefit of this approach for that non-HR major who might be taking an intro to HRM course? Absolutely, Sarah. I've actually found that this is a great way to recruit non-HR majors into the major. I've had students in the past who take my HR course as an elective. Uh, uh, like, for example, there was a student a few years ago who was a supply chain major or concentration, and she took the HR course just because it worked with her schedule. And in that HR course, I did some Excel examples on how to apply different types of simple statistical analyses. And that was all she needed to see because the reason she was in supply chain was that it was a more quantitative field, at least from her perception. And when she saw the opportunity that she could actually influence and help understand people and help the people within the organization using data, 
that got her really excited and she ended up taking off with this and I worked with her. She took my more advanced class and it really opened up a lot of possibilities. And now she ended up doing advanced programming in Python and R and has really run with this. So I think it's a great recruitment tool and it's great to show other areas that um, like uh, students who are coming from their areas, a lot of these tools are gonna be the same or similar that they're applying in their own concentrations or majors. And this is a neat way to show that you can use the same tools and have these in your tool belt, but apply them to different contexts. And so I think the more practice students get applying these tools and these analyses across different contexts, the more it's gonna make sense to them, the more flexible their thinking is gonna be, and the more ultimately transferable these skills will be to their future jobs. Thank you, David. Uh, we have a question coming in from John. Um, how would this change for MBA or an MA in HR courses? I'm assuming this is around maybe the data analytics piece. Okay. Um, yes. Oh, go for it. Go ahead. Okay, I, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. I'll speak to this uh, just quickly. Uh, so I also teach this, I, 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 both Tali and I teach in the HR analytics graduate certificate uh, program we have at Portland State University, which is geared towards working HR professionals with, the, with at least uh, one to two years of experience and sometimes up to 20 years of experience in the HR field. And um, what typically that gets a lot more focused on at that level, or at least we tend to focus on, is we focus a lot more on strategy and um, applying and thinking about why we're asking certain questions and what questions we can ask. And we go a lot deeper into that. And then we go a lot deeper into um, topics related to deciding like how to specify a statistical model or something like that. Um, but really, if you have like an HR course at the MBA level or something that's a general HR course, I think that you can just go deeper into things, but I think focusing on the strategic value of working with data through cases, as well as just um, elucidating some of the, what could be seemingly opaque ways of analyzing data by showing them how to do it simply in Excel or something like that, or another tool they're comfortable with, can really make people um, excited and see the value for HR specifically of using data. Talia, did you want to add? Yeah, I think those are great points. Um, in depth is definitely the, the response that I was going to give. And I think it's just, it becomes qualitatively different in terms of the, the level of the organization to which those people are often or where they hope to be. And so in fact, they actually can take those tools and those skills uh, and immediately implement them at a higher level in the organization. So one of the things that we really coach our very uh, amazing undergraduate students that are that, you know, you're coming in at a lower entry level you can't just walk in and say, I'm going to transform your world and change everything today. So we actually um, coach them quite a bit about how you offer these skills, um, you know, without being overbearing or scaring people off within organizations. So I think the MBAs definitely have um, some opportunities there to go further faster. Thank you, Talia. Um, we have another question. Um, you talk about the currency of the book and data is one of those new and current topics in the field. But what else in your book do you cover that's current that really helps engage students? Yeah, so this is Toya again. Um, we covered a lot of, of examples from the book. Um, and I think it's just, it's confused throughout uh, more modern. So, you know, I first taught, um, you know, HR, I said in 1991, and that book is still in existence. And, um, you know, I think authors do a great job of trying to revise things over the year, over the years, but being able to start from fresh, um, we were really able to kind of think about things differently. And I think the examples throughout are just because the book is newer and because this transformation was already taking place and we were seeing it and tapping into it. Um, I think there's a, a freshness and a currency um, that has a lot of credibility with people in terms of what they're seeing around them and what they're experiencing through selection and hiring um, and their work. So I think kind of in general, there's an infusion throughout, but then what's really, um, what we've heard from faculty using the book um, that's been pretty powerful are having those analytic exercises available. Um, so some like knowing they're there and they offer them as extra credit for students and others are really integrating them into their class. And, you know, it seems a little, um, daunting maybe at first. So some people just introduce one or two the first time they try it. 
um, but we have some people who are definitely using them now every class session, um, and that's become integral. And I would also, from a pedagogical standpoint too, just adding to that, that um, both Talia and I have a lot of experience teaching on the ground, hybrid, and, and also fully online. And a lot of these cases that we were mentioning too, that can highlight uh, really classic traditional HR uh, processes like recruitment, selection, and so forth, and different aspects of them, they, um, the cases that we have in the book are really amenable along with the questions that are associated to them, of online discussion posts and so forth. And we found that the students resonate quite a bit with them. And especially ones that have to do with ethics, um, that seems to be a very fascinating thing for a lot of students to engage with, especially at the undergraduate level, as that idea that there's gray area and ambiguity to something is something that sometimes they're not exposed to a lot. Often there may be you know, thought that there's always gonna be one right, correct solution for every single problem that we have and allowing them to see, well, things aren't always going to be that clear. The law isn't always, isn't going to be completely comprehensive that's going to give clear guidance on every decision you're going to make. Um, that seems to be a really interesting, fun area for them to try to integrate. What do they know about, the, let's say, the legal environment? And how can they then pepper in uh, their new knowledge on ethical decision-making and ethical, ethical decision-making frameworks? Thank you so much, David. Does anybody else um, have any other questions before we wrap things up? We just have a minute or two. I did see one other question about whether slides would be, or whether or not the webinar is being recorded and would be shared. Yes, um, the webinar is being recorded and we will be sending out a link um, in the next few days as soon as it's ready. So that will be coming via email to everybody who registered for the webinar. And also a quick thing that, that I didn't mention um, that I'm in the process of making is that one question that we've gotten to is, well, okay, on a week to, or a class by class basis or on a weekly basis within an HRM course, what does it actually look like to integrate, let's say the data exercises? Um, that's a common question we get, the Excel-based data exercises. How do you actually deploy those and make them ready for students? And um, one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm gonna create a, a, essentially a voiceover video and we're gonna put that on the Sage website that's associated with the textbooks that will show, I'll show our learning management system that we use and like a syllabus, for example, at Portland State University and show how we've gone about integrating some of those into the workflow of a single class and, um, and how the students engage with the tutorials and then how they take the new data and actually apply these on their own and how to give feedback and things like that and at what level. David, I see in Talia one more question. Um, instead of having students take the SHRM certification to be more marketable, would you recommend the HR data analytics or people analytics certif certification? I think that uh, for a lot of the, at least the undergraduate students, I think the general SHRM certificate is would be a great starting, starting place. Um, as far as the SHRM specific people analytics credential that they're offering now, I think I would I'd personally recommend that to students as an add-on, um, as a way to further refine and specify what they're doing. In terms of, as Talia was alluding to earlier, I, at least the job postings that we're seeing in the general Portland metropolitan area, and I don't know to what extent this generalizes um, nationally across the country, we tend to see that a lot of the bachelor's level uh, positions that these students are going into in HR tend to not, um, it's not as common to see that they're explicitly looking for someone with skills and data analytics or working with specific data analytics tools. Uh, rather, they're looking for general skills around Excel and things like that and general HR knowledge. And so for that reason, um, we kind of sometimes, as Talia was mentioning, we try to coach the students into thinking about how do you not come off as uh, you know condescending or intimidating for potential employers by bringing in this outside, oh, you know, I can bring this to your company. Um, straight out of a bachelor's degree. And so instead, I think that sometimes it's useful to uh, think about those types of credentials for students who are doing maybe a graduate certificate or a more advanced type of um, specialization in HR people analytics, and then do that type of add-on credential. 
Okay, we're just about time. I know there's a few other questions that we didn't get to, um, and I will share those with our um, pres presenters and try to uh, get some feedback for you when we send out the webinar uh, as well. So if there's any other questions, feel free to send them directly to me, Sarah. My email is in your webinar invitation. Um, but at this point, we're at two o'clock. I want to thank everybody for attending and joining Talia and David and to our presenters. Thank you so much for this valuable information. I hope everybody found it useful and thank you again for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye everyone.